Hi everyone, welcome to Wild Acres Week, a series of online events presented by Greensod Ireland, a voluntary run land trust uh, working to protect the wild acres of Ireland and all its biodiversity. I am Ashley Downey and I'm delighted to be hosting today's talk, which is all about biodiversity. I'm here with my colleague, Michelle Teig, and together we've designed Wild Acres Week as a way to celebrate biodiversity, as well as to explore the importance of biodiversity and ecosystem restoration. We've invited scientists, artists, environmentalists, and con generally concerned citizens to join us throughout Wild Acres Week to share their insights and stories and to discuss their knowledge of biodiversity and hopefully help us understand more about what role we might be able to play in helping to protect nature and all its biodiversity. So first of all, I'd like to thank those speakers for uh, joining us, particularly today being a bank holiday. And again, thank you all for joining us. So I'm just going to go straight into it because we, we've only got an hour and I really think we've got lots to cover and um, really exciting projects. So we're going to start first with um, Janet Laffey, who is a landscape and environmental consultant. She's also the eco ecological coordinator for Greensod Ireland. She runs um, be aware education programs uh, for our primary schools in the west of Ireland and she also works at project coordinating a number of regeneration and rewilding uh, projects on behalf of Green Sod Ireland. Janet if you want to take it away. Thanks very much Ashley yeah um, thanks for that introduction everyone likes a good review so thanks very much. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen here. So yeah, all about uh, biodiversity. So um, as Ashley says, my name is Janet Laffey and um, I've been a Green South Ireland volunteer for about three years now. And I work on various different projects. And I first got involved in the education side of things. So I go into primary schools and we talk about biodiversity. We learn about pollinators. Uh, we look at how we can make a plan for their school grounds and to make the school ground more pollinator friendly. So the other side of Green Sod Ireland is that the organization is a land trust. And we have parcels of land in six different counties. And the aim is to create wild acres in every county in Ireland. So our mission is protecting land for its own sake and for the sake of the species that live on it. So that means that any management decisions that we make about the land are done so with the species being front and center um, in terms of priority. So that doesn't mean that we separate humans from the process, um, the opposite in fact, it's just that our main concern is uh, for the species and the plants and the animals that live there. So that has an impact on the decisions we make in terms of land management. And I think the word biodiversity, it gets used a lot. It's, in some ways, it's a, it's a new enough kind of a word, but it gets used a lot. And when I do the, the primary school workshops, we look at biodiversity in this way. Um, and I think it's, I think, well, I, I didn't get this education at school. And I think kids are kind of bombarded with this type of education. And we kind of forget that adults don't really, haven't really learned it. So bio is, is life. And diversity is a range of different species, as I said, including humans. And I always try to include humans in that. Um, so, and the thing about biodiversity is that it's part of an Earth system, and everything within that is connected. And also, if you disrupt or take away part of that system, like let's say the decline of our pollinators and our insects, then that is a real knock-on effect on the rest of the system. And I think that's part of the reason why rewilding has become so topical at the moment. And Green South Ireland have recently been accepted as members of Rewilding Europe, um, second to the Dun Dunsany estate. And I think we have um, Randolph speaking later on in the week, so that'll be really interesting. Um, so their definition of rewilding is a progressive approach to conservation. It's about letting nature take care of itself, enabling nature, natural processes to shape land, sea, and have repair damaged ecosystems and restore degraded landscapes. And in my opinion, restore is quite a strong word to use. And I think restore means something, or the definition is to return something to its original state. Um, but the reality is there are landscapes, especially in Ireland, have been so altered over the years that we really need to give nature a helping hand to get back on its feet sometimes before that can start to happen. Or else we accept that the landscape has been altered and you allow it to carry on and, and evolve as it will. <clears throat> so 
So an example of this is one of our sites in Donegal, and this is on the initial peninsula. So it's former farmland. Um, it's been drained and attempts have been made over the years to reclaim the land and make it productive. It's upland blanket bog and well, part of it is. So productive, I suppose, obviously only refers to how it can be productive for humans. And so that ignores the productivity for the species that live there. Uh, so part of the site is a three hectare um, piece of degraded blanket bog. And when our ecologist, uh, James Owens, uh, did a habitat assessment there, he observed that the bog was showing signs of drying out. So you can actually see from our map, this here, oh, is the, the actual um, peatland, and the orange bit shows scrubland that's, that's encroaching on it. So if we, uh, sorry, somebody ask, ask you questions? No. Um, so you might argue that um, this is the way that it is, that this, this piece of land is drying out and that's okay. But on the other hand, the, the peatland is actually releasing carbon into the atmosphere. Um, and by allowing it to, to sort of re, generate as scrubland or and woodland, which has a value in itself, then we're allowing it to happen over quite a long time. So the balance of it actually coming back into a, a positive as opposed to a negative could take quite a long time. And as we know, you know, time isn't something that we have a lot of um, from a biodiversity point of view. So those are the kind of things that we think of when we're, when we're making man management decisions about the land. So there's a lot of kind of juggling sometimes to, to know what's the best way to do things. This is a map of all of the sites across um, Ireland from Donegal, Carlo, we have um, Mayo and Connemara. There's a site down in Ross Carberry as well. And this just gives you a kind of a very brief breakdown of the different habitats that are there. And there are subsets within these categories as well, but it just gives you different um, types of, of habitats that are there. So then another side of uh, land management is the idea of community development. And this is our site in, um, Ross Carberry, so it's Porca Tubber. And this is a really good example of where humans can be brought into the fold um, successfully. So they support the local community um, to learn more about the biodiversity. Um, they offer courses on, on a range of different things. Uh, they take part in social farming schemes uh, and work with community employment schemes. And Porca Tubber um, is a really good example of how that can be done uh, really well. It's a lovely place. The site was gifted to the organizations by the Sisters of Mercy in 2018. And the people that gift the land are, are there, uh, we're ensuring the land is preserved for biodiversity going forward in the future. So this, uh, this, uh, this winter just gone, they've planted 750 native trees and they engage with the local TY students um, to do some of the planting. So. They work with co-action, so that's a group, um, who, they have service users that come in once a week and do some work. And they also work with a special needs group from a local school. Uh, so this is a great example of how, I suppose, humans are part of biodiversity. And while our mission in Green Sod um, is to protect the land for its own sake, that doesn't mean that we exist outside of the system. Humans don't exist outside the system. In fact, it's important that we develop more places like Port Cotubber, um, because you know, humans thrive on connection, you know, and connection with nature, but also connection with each other. And Green South Ireland strives to be an organization that provides for all the aspects um, for, for uh, both of those things. So that's it. Um, I think we're taking questions at the end, Ashley, are we? Yeah. Yeah, at the end. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Janet. A lovely overview of Green South, that's some of the work we do. Um, next up, we have uh, Kate Lavender, and Kate Lavender works with uh, Burn Bio Trust down in the Burn. Um, she's the Education and Conservation Officer there. Um, she delivers um, sort of place based education programs and is also the coordinator for their conservation um, volunteer program. For anyone who doesn't know, Burn Bio Trust is an environmental and heritage conservation organization dedicated to. Um, connecting people with nature, um, with the land, um, and indeed, kind of, their kind of our role in caring for um, our place, our natural place. 
And um, so Kate today is going to be talking about active conservation for biodiversity, burn butterflies and other native species. Lovely, thanks so much, Ashley. Um, so as, as Ashley's already said, um, I work for Burn Bio Trust. So I won't kind of touch too much on the work of the Trust. We'll just have a really quick look at the biodiversity of the Burren, you know, why it's a very special place. Now, all of our education models have been developed around the Burren as a place, but all our models have now turned into education models you can take and develop in any part of Ireland. So it's all about connecting people to all the different layers of the landscape. So I'm just going to show you nice Burren pictures and show you some of the biodiversity um, that makes the Burren such a special place and then just touch on the work of our conservation volunteers. So we run over 27 different programmes with six part-time members of staff. So we do um, an awful lot of work. We work up, we're based up in the Burren. Uh, just, you all know where the Burren is, but just to remind you, it's actually spaced out over two counties. So the majority is in County Clare, but there is a little tiny bit in County Galway. So it means we often work with two county councils. Uh, in some ways that can be great for applying for funding. It gives us two different places um, to access. Where the Burren actually is, there is no definite line on the ground that says this is Burren, this is not Burren. So it's very open to contention. So some people say it's just the highlands where you can kind of see the lovely rocky hills that we have. And some people argue it extends out into the Burren lowlands. Um, so there's no definite boundary. It runs from, you can say it's between 250 to 560 square kilometers in area. And it goes from just about sea level to just over 300 meters. And when you're looking at the Burren, the Burren, only part of the Burren that is nationally owned is the Burren National Park. So that's about 20 to 25 kilometers square. So the rest of the Burren is actually private land. So it's owned by farmers and managed by farmers. Um, always makes me laugh when they say the Burren, 12 kilometers, you know, you wonder where in the Burren they're sending you to, but that's another story. So when you look at the Burren, you have to remember that it is actually a man-made landscape. So the landscape itself was shaped by the glaciers 12 to 14,000 years ago. That's when we saw some of the plants coming in, but actually in the Mesa, in the Neolithic times, Mesolithic hunter gatherers, they're, they're, they're not actually doing very much uh, to the landscape, but no, our no, Neolithic sorry. people, sorry, we've got people joining in. <laughs> so our Neolithic people about 6,000 years ago started farming the landscape. And that's what really started, um, you know, creating what we see in the Burren today. So the Burren is an ancient managed landscape, but it is a really important biodiversity hotspot. And I'm gonna show you some of the things that make it so important. And they really highlight the importance of continuing to manage the landscape now to keep this special biodiversity. So um, General Ludlow from the Cromwellian army, everyone knows the quote. Um, it looks like a pretty awful landscape. The poor man had just ridden for two to three days in the rain to get to County Clare to get into the Burren and he didn't like what he saw, but people often forget that final part, yet their cattle are very fat. So there's obviously something there that is very good that you might not necessarily notice. So when you look at the Burren, the variety of habitats in the Burren is really very, very wide. You know, you think of the Burren as very dry. We do have water, we do have coast, and we do have the mature woodlands. So we have a massive variety of um, different habitats. And that's what makes it so special in biodiversity terms. So an awful lot of the na native plant species are here. There are some rarities. Um, and it's this mix of species that we're getting that you don't often see these plants together and the lime loving lime hating you'll find them very close together and of course the burren orchids so uh, to cheer you up on a bank holiday monday when it might be raining where you are i'll show you some of the pictures now of uh, some of these specialities so we have here um this is the irish eye bright uh, the dark red helleborine is in Ireland, as far as I'm aware, it's only found out in the Burren, so it's a fabulous little plant. We have the fragrant orchid. I've still never seen one, but they're meant to smell, they're meant to smell absolutely fabulous. Uh, Autumn ladies' tresses, and we have the lovely shrubby sank foil. The only other Irish location that I'm aware of is Loch Corrib, so, you know, really important we have it here in the Burren. And then we have this plant called the thyme broom rape that again, it's a real, got a real stronghold for itself in the Burren. 
Um, if we look at this, um, oh, sorry, I forgot about the hoary rock rose as well, which is actually so special. It's found in the Burren, it's protected by Irish law. So you can see already from these rarities, the Burren is a very, very special landscape. When we start looking at the strange mix of plants we get together, you often get these plants in different parts of the world, but rarely growing next to each other. So our mountain avens, Arctic, probably came in with the glaciers 12 to 14,000 years ago. Uh, the beautiful orchids now, the bee orchid and our fly orchid, um, you'll find them growing next to the mountain avens. Then uh, we have our butterfly orchid as well, a beautiful little plant. We have our spring gentian. This is an alpine plant. You know, you usually tend to find it two, 3,000 metres, and we can find it all the way down to sea level here in the Burren. And uh, another lovely Mediterranean plant is that bloody crane's bill. So we have this variety of plants all growing together that you don't find together in other parts of the world. Um, then when we look at our lime loving, lime hating plants, so cat's paw, um, also called mountain everlasting, but you can see the name cat's paw, turn your cat upside down very gently and his foot will look like that flower, hopefully. <laughs> Do put him back the right way up when you've finished. Um, and we've got our Herb Robert and um, our O'Kelly spotted orchid. So these are a lime loving ones. And th this orchid is lovely. It was actually a subspecies described by a Ballyvohan botanist, um, Patrick O'Kelly, where the name came from. Then we get our lime hating. We find these on little pockets of um, peat usually. So we have some bit of vetch, we have heathers, and we have the tormental as well. So you can kind of see this range of flowers and plants that we get. What's very, very important is we have these plants here because of the way the land used to be farmed. So quite conveniently, this is one wall dividing two different farmers land. The farmer to the left on the screen, he practices winterage. So he moves his cattle up into the Burren Hills in the winter time. They graze back the dead grass. The farmer on the right probably brings his cattle down into the slatted sheds and keeps them there for the winter before letting them back. So in the springtime, the farmer on the left who practices winterage, he gets the beautiful Burren Meadows. Whereas the farmer on the right who doesn't, he gets this very rank kind of grass that's very species poor. So you can see it's kind of really down to the cow and the way that farmers are managing their landscape. We also with Burren Bio, we do have conservation volunteers as one of our little sidelines as one of the programs that we run. So they run under um, the Burren Bio Trust and we support them with office and uh, helping to pay towards insurance and fundraising and things. So there's one very special site up in the heart of the borough near the perfumery, and this is a butterfly habitat management. So again, without our pollinators and our other species, the flowers wouldn't be here as well. But this site now is um, a really special site because it's being managed for the marsh fritillary. Um, the marsh fritillary is, is quite a rare butterfly, um, and this is kind of one of the strongholds for where it breeds. So if we don't manage this landscape, we'll, we'll lose this butterfly from the burren. So there's the little marsh fritillary caterpillars. They overwinter as caterpillars. Um, they need these little nests. They're very picky. They need to have south facing sheltered places because they need sunshine to digest their food. Um, there's the beautiful little marsh fritillary when it comes out in a butterfly. And the, the purpley flower in that picture, that's what's so important. That's what the marsh fritillary wants. It's the devil's bit scabious. So that's the, the caterpillar's um, food plant. So what we're doing at this site is we're clearing back the scrub to manage the area for it, but also at this site we have 22 different butterfly species found. Some of them just living here, um, some of them just passing by, some of them breeding. Um, so it makes it an absolute top priority site to keep our volunteers working at, to keep this ground clear back. Now it's a total testament to this site up in the Burren. That the, the habitat is so special, so rich that even in very bad years for butterflies, we've still managed to keep these butterflies living and breeding up in the Burren. So this is just one of the locations that we're working for. And uh, just to finish up with a, a final plug for, for Burren Bio Trust, I've only skimmed over the Burren, I'm afraid, on what we do. Uh, Ten minutes is very short, and I'm sure Ashley, I've gone over, so I'm sorry, but. What we're working to do, I think Jane Goodall kind of sums it up perfectly in, in her quote, you know, if we understand, we care, if we care, we help, if we help, we can save things. So we do a lot of work with them, um, with children of different ages, with adult groups, connecting them to their landscapes. Their landscape doesn't even have to be the Burren landscape. Their place doesn't have to be the Burren place. Every place is special and every place, if we learn what's special about it, 
we want to look after it a bit more so we can all work together and save it. So if you do want to find out more about Borough and Bio and the work we do, you can have a look on our website. We have a massive range of programmes. We have some uh, new conservation programmes we're working on and we have our education programmes as well. So um, again, Ashley, I think all the questions are for the end, are they there? And uh, I'm sorry if I did go over on time there. There's just too much to talk about. Perfect timing, perfect timing. Perfect. <laughs> your comment there um, and Jane Goodall's quote about we really need people to care because if people don't care then we're not going to um you know we're really not going to care for the land um and actually that just brings me on then to my next um speaker who really does care we have Paul Hendricks here um from the Bee Sanctuary of Ireland and Paul with his wife uh Claire Louise basically about a decade ago set up the first and only ever um sanctuary in the world and um, dedicated to native wild bees um, it's um, I'm not going to say too much about it as Paul will, will tell you himself but um, I met Paul um, through a different talk with climate reality leaders and what really struck me about the work he did was was that passion and caring for the future um, and really he he talked about that the, 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 the need for um, not just action, but real action and really kind of addressing the problems. So um, one of the things that Michelle and I felt was really important when programming this was to try and bring um, experts in the field, generally concerned citizens, artists, different voices together. And I think um, what Paul and his wife are doing um, for the for, on their land is just wonderful. So again, uh, thank you, Paul, and I'll pass over to you. Thanks, Ashley. I just setting a stopwatch there so I don't go over because I usually only get warmed up about the 45 minute mark. Um, um, this is coming from the, the Beast Sanctuary of Ireland. I decided to sit outside today to kind of give everyone a feel. We're, we're talking about nature. We should we should see it. I think too much too much talk is done about nature in, in hotel conference centres and, and detached from nature when you start talking about nature in nature. Um, the Beast Sanctuary of Ireland, um, I'm going to talk really quickly because I'm going to try and get through as much as possible. Um, we're 55 acres, the size of 31 um, football pitches. Um, we're, we're basically, we've been a bee, bee sanctuary for coming on four years. We bought, we bought the farm about 10 years ago. Um, we, we, we bought it because we walked onto it and it had been let go to a certain extent. There was, it was a 12 acre wetland. There was um, ditches that were are 30 meters wide. Um, there was three brothers that bought it and they were setting it up for, for hunting on, for, for shooting pheasant and for shooting ducks. And of course, this horrified us, but what we saw in it was the potential. And it had been on the market for a while because people, farmers didn't want it because of too much waste, too much, too much land that wasn't, wasn't, wasn't productive. And we, we saw that as, as, as the, the jewel. We, we, that's, what, that's what interested us. And um, so we bought it and we became organic, then we became vegan organic or stock free organic. We're the only certified, uh, that we know, the only certified stock free organic land in the country at the moment. Um, we we were we were we were going to we were setting up a, a lettuce and our salad and veg business and we went away on the first holiday we'd had in years came back and the deer and rabbits had come across what we had in the ground and party then basically it was gone and i found myself i think it was september 2017 sitting in a, in a field of clover surrounded by bees wondering what i was going to do because it was going to cost tens of thousands to put deer fencing up and and the realization came on me that that's not why we bought the place we bought the place because of the biodiversity and here we were thinking about trying to keep it off so we could we could grow grow food so we just i remember walking back into clara Wees at the time and just saying listen crazy idea we, we just set it up as a bee sanctuary bees all over the place the bees are in trouble so something we're doing here is right to have that many bees around and we just in fairness to Claire, she goes, okay, you, you're crazy, but we'll, we'll, we'll look at it, we'll do it. So we kind of didn't know what to do. We kind of stayed quiet about it over the, over the, the summer. And the first time we, we said we were, we were officially a bee sanctuary was I was at a local search engine optimization um, course down in Arklow. And, you, you know, in the morning you come around and people, you introduce yourself and you just say organic farmer and it's kind of, oh, yeah, fine. And this time I said, we're, we set up a bee sanctuary, the place cheered. And we kind of, I was kind of like, whoa, that was, what, what was that reaction? And that's the reaction we've had had about it since from from the general public, um, from creatives especially, um, environmentalists, people in the environmental space. Um, we reached out to them, not interested. If I'm honest about it, not interested. And um, we don't claim to be experts in what we do here. Um, we're I'd say we're experts at not being experts. 
and um, it was interesting because the word biodiversity was used there and I saw I came across a study a couple of years back or a, a, some research that was done in Australia where they asked people to define biodiversity and it was I can't remember the exact figure but it was it was up in the above 75 percent of people I think didn't know what biodiversity was could, couldn't define it so we don't use the word biodiversity we use the word nature and we try and keep it as simple as possible um we we we, we do our, what we're trying to do here is educate people and, and inspire people as well because I've looked around the 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 environmental space over the last number of years I'm the wrong side of 50 and I'm bored if I'm honest but I'm bored there's nothing there's nothing inspiring me and I'm kind of going well if I'm not getting inspired at my age um is how are we going to inspire 20 year olds how are we going to inspire teenagers how are we going to inspire the next generation and we we need we need to stop being so lazy about it and so I think there's a lot a lot in the environmental uh, space that are it's kind of because we're here, we deserve to be listened to, and we're, 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 we're because we're, the, we're kind of the knights and shining, shining armor coming to horse. We, 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 people should just listen to us, take what we say. We, we don't come from that. We, we feel we have to work at it. We have to, we have to inspire people. We have to, we have to compete, almost commercially on a commercial level, just to say, like as, as a business would, we, we need to attract people in to, to biodiversity, and that's where we come from. I mean, I can give you figures on. We know, we know what's happening with our insects, with our bees. Um, 76% of flying insects that are studied from Germany over over 26 years, 76% of flying insects by mass gone, 50% of our bee species study out this year from Argentina, 50% of our bee species aren't been, even been recorded worldwide now. And they're not showing up, and that, that's despite more citizen science, more people going looking for them, they're not showing up on record. So we're, we're in serious trouble here. And I think a lot of people on here will know that. And it, it's what we do about it. And we see a lot of solutions that have been put forward that, that aren't, sorry, that's my five minute mark. Um, we see a lot of solutions being put forward and while they're what I call pseudo solutions or nice solutions or easy solutions, they're not gonna do enough. They're not, they're not gonna get us there. And we, we need to realize that. There's no point in being nice about it. Um, we see um, other, other um, people in the space and they're not telling the truth honest about it they're not they're not being honest with people and i think i think it's patronizing the people i think if people are told the truth they'll take it on and if it might be a little bit harder to do what what needs to be done but they'll do it people people generally are good and we're not giving them that chance and i think that's 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 going to history is not going to judge the people that are doing that well because if you're telling an example is people um say for people want to put on later friendly flowers in their, in their garden they go down to the garden center with the kids on a saturday they buy 50, 100 years worth of plants to go back to the garden and put them in. Chances are those those plants are, are, are doused in a cocktail of chemicals, fungicides, pesticides, and they don't know that. These, these, these plants are actually more than likely harmful to the, to the insects landing on them and to the soil that they, they leach into. We say to people, we, we know what others that won't say it, we, we, we've pushed them on why they won't say it, and they've got to go, oh, they just, they just don't, they won't even answer. And what we do is we just say to people, and people go, oh, really? And we say, yeah, and they go, well, what can we do? We say, you can plant swap, you can grow from seed, you can, you know, and, and they just go, okay, thanks, where do we get it from? So the, people will do it. And we need to give people the chance to do that. And we need, we need to, and that comes back to the messaging and the communication and what we say to people. And I'm, I'm trying to keep it positive here, but it, it's, it's, I'm always, I don't always want to be the grumpy, the grumpy guy in the room, but what we do here is inspiring anyone that comes down to us, just, just as amazed at, at the place and our messaging seems to work. So we feel it's, it's, we have a responsibility, I suppose, to actually to go and talk about the bad stuff and talk about the darker side of it, and to to make let people know. And it, it it's not it's not when we're critical, it's not to be critical, it's not to drag people down. It's it's to actually say, listen, let's do better. I mean, we, we it's it's. I I was speaking to a a, um, a guy who's um. He's a would be a bee expert. Right? Would be would be one of the top bee guys. And just a couple of years back, and I was talking about the the the. The solution of the, the strips of wildflowers down the side of the the farms and, and i said to him, come on like from my coming from from the from the point of view i have which is not an expert i know that that doesn't work just that you, you can see it you, you can find it in the first couple of searches on google what, what that what that actually does and the response to me was well it's better than nothing and this is i, I like this guy he's a good guy but I, my, my my reaction to that was better than nothing doesn't get us out of this we have to be at our best and beyond our best. We have to push ourselves. And that, that's what we do here. We ask people to push themselves. And I, I, I suppose what we do, we're, we're the only 
um, native wild beast sanctuary on the planet. I think my my my, my seven year old um, came to me a couple of months back. She said to me, "How many people are on the planet, Dad?" And I said, "Billion." She goes, "No, how many?" I said, "Around seven point eight billion." And she just turned around. She goes, "And we're the only six with a native bee sanctuary." And it kind of it kind of really really struck me, really really hit me, then that yeah we are. We're, we're maybe we're not the only ones to think, but we're the only ones to do it. And that that's that's the crux of it. We need, we need action. Um, I'm probably going over. My, I don't know what I'm going over my time now. So if, if you want to just flag me, actually, because I'll I'll keep going. But but what we say to people is, take action. Let's not just talk about it. We we we, we need to study. We need we need we need the academia. We need we need the knowledge. But we need to do something with that knowledge. That knowledge in itself won't do anything. It'll, it'll just sit there. What we need to do is get that knowledge, break it down, and that's what we do. We we read all the research. We break it down. We try and give it to people in little snippets that they'll understand that they'll they'll action and make it as, as simple as possible. We've got we've got a short attention span in on the planet at the moment. So we have to give things a little bit and as simple as possible to people to get them to. But but if we're doing that, let's make it the right stuff. Let's let's give them the real stuff. That's what we say. And um, I suppose I'm not. We're not. We're not great at advertising yourself. So anyone's listening hasn't come across before. You, you'll, you'll catch us on www.thebeesanctuaryofireland.com. Um, we've another couple of initiatives we've launched off the off the off the sanctuary to uh, the national meadowland to try and get two percent of farmland back into traditional species rich meadows which um a study we came across in the uk indicated that if we did that um the bees there's a ch good chance the bees would start recovering within five years and um, if we could give them that two percent now that's one in 50 acres and I, I can walk onto any farm in this country and find you an acre that's been you that's not that that could be used for that it's not your it's not your rich land you're looking for it's your it's your, your poor land and your 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 your, your the bits that are at the side and we, we could do that and it's things like that that we love to do we've also set up something called big nature which is trying to get um, people to join us to as an honest new lobbying voice for for nature to try and we're not where there's no there's no fee to join up it's just literally used Give us your name and, and join us and we'll, we'll try and lobby for nature because it needs to be shook up the space and as far as we're concerned i say this is coming from a couple of old crusties um it needs to be shook up that we need change and we need to change the way we look at it the way we do things and we need action more so than talk that's i think great. i'm probably over my time so um, that's great well thank you so much <laughs> not at all not at all and that's um i love always your 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 honesty and your drive and as you said for for real action i mean um one of the things, as you mentioned, which is really important, is the, getting the right information out there. Um, it's quite interesting that you say, you know, the, the word biodiversity, that some people don't know what that is, because actually recently um, myself and a, a group of other people did a survey on the word sustainability, because that's another word that we talk about, you know, sustainable, a new sustainable future. And a lot of people really as well don't quite necessarily know what does that mean either. Um, so, um, big part of why we, we put on the event today is not only to celebrate biodiversity, but also, you know, to, 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 to try and make a difference and make a change and, and, and make a future that, um, that we're going to survive in as well as, you know, the, the nature. So thank you very much um, for bringing that up. And as always, I, I do, I love the fact that, you know, you drive us all to, to real action, which is important. Um, and as you said, the bite size information is really, really important and breaking things down. And again, I think that goes back to Kate's comment about getting people to care. People do care. Sometimes there's too much out there, but if we can simplify and give real information, um, hopefully we can make a difference. Um, speaking of inspiring and getting people to care, my, then our next speaker is Sean Taylor. And I um, heard Sean talk about this project that he's about to talk about now. Um, and I was actually so inspired by his project that um, I ended up doing a master's with him. He, um, he's a lecturer in Limerick School of Art and Design, um, both in the sculpture department, but he also runs a master's called MA Space, which is a master's in social practice and the creative environment. And after hearing about the project um, that he's going to talk about today called Songs of the Bees, I was so inspired that I signed up on the master's to, to, to study under him. Um, so he's very, very inspiring. Sean um, is going to, this particular project is actually um, about beehives, um, more so than biodiversity per se. But what is really, really interesting for me was um, it's, it's a kind of collaboration between himself as, an, as a, a visual artist and um, a sort of software engineer, if I'm, if I'm right, Sean. And they recorded, um, part of the project was to record the sounds of the bees, um, which to me was fascinating. But 
I'll leave Sean to tell you about the project. Thanks very much, Sean. Thanks very much indeed. If I could only attract more students like that, it would be fantastic. Um, okay, I'll just share the screen here. Okay, so uh, it's interesting just hearing Paul talk and following on from Paul's talk. I mean, everything that I have done in my, uh, I'm one part of a collaboration called Soft Day. And we've been dealing with sort of uncomfortable environmental realities for quite a number of years. And I suppose the this is, we're, we're very much about direct action, but at the same time, trying to educate people um, around the various contested issues to do with environmental um, um, stressors. So Around the Mayak, or Song of the Bees, it's a project that was only supposed to last two years. And uh, as you can see, it's been going on for, for quite a while now. Um, it really all started with this uh, headline in the in the Time in Time magazine, uh, "World Without Bees." The first mention of Connolly Collapse Disorder or CCD, um, which uh, got me very very exercised and very upset about uh, the stressors that that our pollinators were were being put under unnecessarily by us humans, and the implications of Connolly Collapse Disorder. Um, for pollinations, of, uh, particularly of, of, uh, of food and foodstuffs um, and, and the implications for, 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 uh, for, for living on this planet. Um, so we started, um, I have to confess, I knew absolutely zip nothing about beekeeping back in uh, when we started the project. Um, so we, we started a dialogue because I'm a socially engaged practitioner I suppose we started a dialogue with, with local beekeepers in Limerick and in County Limerick, um, trying to gauge from them what was the impact of Connolly Collapse Disorder uh, on a local level, uh, because we'd seen obviously the results of it on a global level. And um, some of the results that we had got back uh, from them, just anecdotally, was quite shocking. And, and so we... Um, we plowed on with a project where, to try and raise the awareness uh, around this issue uh, with the general public, but from a creative perspective, because one of the problems you'll probably all know is that um, when you start getting up and banging a drum about environmentalism, um, half the population switch off uh, because they've heard it all before or they're not interested. So we had to come up with sort of clever and indiscreet um, and interesting ways of engaging people. So. Because I work with a software engineer, uh, as Ashley mentioned, um, we are able to, um, in the work that we do in Soft Day, we're able to convert any numerical data into music. We have, we have hacked and brutalized and created algorithms that will allow us to convert that data into a piece of music. And then we can shape it and flavor it, and we can hand it to an orchestra and say, here, play that. So, um, these are some of the conditions which I'm not going to get into because I'm, I'm not here to talk about the politics of it all. It's well documented. Um, so um, we started the project. We got some money from the Arts Council of Ireland to, to and, and create, which is a, a national organization for collaborative and community arts. And um, we, we, we went out, talked to beekeepers, documented uh, their stories. And then actually uh, flipped their relationship with us and actually uh, encouraged them to join us in the project um, towards a kind of creative end. Now, I have to say that none of the beekeepers we've worked with had any experience working with what we call computer generated music. Um, so we had to learn how or we had to teach them how to um, to use their laptops as musical instruments. And here, as you can see, the software that we were uh, showing them how to use, it was very simple software that they could get. So they, they could record the sound of their own apries and they could load up these uh, sample sounds, uh, almost like the way that a DJ would mix sounds. And then they could, as an ensemble, you could mix it live. So that was, that was part of the exchange uh, in the project. So in exchange for them teaching us about bees, um, we, we worked with them to become laptop players as part of a, a musical ensemble, and it worked very, very well. Um, we also then, as, as, as Ashley rightly said, we, we devised a system for recording the inside of the beehive. Um, you can see here we have a little um, 
these, these tiny little microphones that are inlaid into the um, the frames that you put in the the super box of a, of a beehive, and we were able to record using um, a, like quadraphonic recording devices uh, and without disturbing the bees. And we you could tell from the sound of the bees what kind of condition they were on at every at any given time during the day, and then we fed those recordings into the overall performance. Um, we worked with um, the monks of Glenstall Abbey in Maroo in County Limerick, mainly because they uh, they have a huge apiary there, and the 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 head apiarist there is a brother Simon, and we, we he was the guy who taught us actually everything we know we now know about beekeeping, and uh, we'd also wanted to work with the monks themselves because they're absolutely fantastic singers, and we wanted to create a, a choral element for them based on on the Connolly collapse disorder. So what we got in terms of data, we got four years of Connolly collapse disorder data from Chagas and from a, um, a Dr. Mary Coffey, who's based in Trinity. And we were able to convert that into a choral element that the monks improvised on, and then a, a, um, a musical composition that the Irish Chamber Orchestra played. Uh, and we put the whole thing together live in Glenstall Abbey Church. And we also had our beekeepers with us playing live as well. And then you can see here on the pulpit in, in um, uh, Judy Kravitz, who's a beekeeper from uh, Cork, uh, who wrote this beautiful book. Uh, it's a, a, a year of, of a diary called uh, Tell It to the Bees. And um, she's, she's reading extracts from her diary. So that was the... Um, that was the outcome of that performance, and that was the end of the project. And then somebody came along and said, uh, that was a very interesting performance. Um, if you had a bit of money, what would you like to do next? And we said, well, look, we would be very interested in, in starting a conversation with the citizens of Limerick City to see if we could start a citizen uh, beekeepers uh, sort of group or an urban beekeeping project. And so we were given a bit of seeding money from, from Lim Limerick City Gallery of Art. And we put out a public call for volunteers. And this is the first round of volunteers, as you can see in the gallery. Um, and so in return for giving them their time and volunteering, we purchased all the equipment, everything except the bees. And then we, we uh, rehired uh, Simon Sleeman, the, uh, the uh, Apriest from uh, Glenstall Abbey to come in and teach us all, including myself and Michael, how to become beekeepers. And uh, here you can see us um, working away. Um, so the response was, was great initially, and we all learned how to make every single part of the hive that was part of the training. And, um, and then of course, we, we worked up in Glenstall Abbey, up in their, up in their training apiary and, um, that was all Jim Dandy and, and, and very commendable until it came to, to uh, actually finding sites for the bees, purchasing the bees and actually becoming full-time beekeepers. So uh, as soon as we did that, we lost half of our members and, um, and that was quite a shock. Uh, people just didn't want the responsibility. They wanted, they liked, they liked the idea of supporting the project, but when it actually came to being sort of um, minders and carers of bees, uh, they balked. Um, so that was a very sobering moment. Um, anyway, we, we continued on and we, we got permissions. It took us quite a long time to get permissions to place the beekeep, the, 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 sorry, the, the hives in very, very public places. So you can see here on the left, that's uh, on a church tower. Uh, it's St. Mungert's Church in Limerick. Um, the image in the middle is the hive that I was looking after with Michael. That's based up in the Limerick Learning Hub in Toman Gate, in a very working class area um, where we had lots of problems initially with the kids throwing stones at the hives, but we managed to bring them around over a period of time. And now we've got lots of the kids from the area who are beekeepers themselves. So they don't keep ponies anymore, they keep bees. And, uh, and then obviously putting, putting hives in people's back gardens. So in the meantime, as we're doing that, we got an opportunity to go to Sweden to work with some uh, rural beekeepers in Helen County in, the, in, in the, the west of Sweden. And they have a completely different system over there for, for beekeeping, which was uh, quite amazing. And we worked with beekeepers over there as part of this big international sound art festival 
and we involved again, as we always do, we involve beekeepers in the creative outcome of what we did, again, getting them to record their apiaries and sounds and playing the piece live. So this is the result of the, uh, the piece we did in Sweden. I won't even begin to pronounce the name of it, but it was a very fancy name for a very small project. Um, and then this brings us to um, 2014. We were approached by Limerick National City of Culture who wanted us to redo the Ara on the Bay of the Song of the Bees project. Um, and we said, okay, we'll do it, but we'll do it completely differently. We won't use the monks of Glenstall this time. We'll use a completely different lineup and we'll use different beekeepers, uh, some of our urban beekeepers that we'd started to work with. And we worked with the Boherby Brass and Reed Band and they actually played, we scored the uh, four years of colony collapse. Well, it was actually five years of colony collapse disorder data and we scored it for a piece for them to play and God bless them. They, they struggled manfully to play a very abstract piece of music. Um, and then we, uh, and we had loads of audience participation and, uh, and again, raised loads of awareness about, about the project. So phase four started in 2015, where we extended the reach of the urban beekeeping project out further out into the, into the, the city in Limerick. Uh, we located uh, hives in the art school, uh, with the first art school in Ireland to have their own apiary. We still have it and it's going really, really, really well. The Hunt Museum has located uh, hives in their museum. And here are some of the beekeepers that we trained, um, again, from scratch and kitted them out and, and got them started and negotiated um, for the, the placement of hives around the city. We then, as we were doing all that, we then got invited to go to Paris to work with some urban beekeepers in Paris. And that was quite a, quite a revelation because there's over 700 apiaries in the city of Paris. Um, um, urban beekeeping in Paris is massive. Even in the, in the parks and uh, the main parks, they, they, they keep bees. There's a, there's a real um, joy and education about the way that beekeeping is completely integrated into the city. Um, and of course, uh, people make a small fortune from selling um, uh, Paris urban honey. Um, and then we, 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 again, working with urban beekeepers in Paris, we, we involved them in the outcome of, of the project, the creative outcome. Um, and we, 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 we started to become a bit more self-sufficient in 2016, but it really wasn't until 2018 that we were com we, the project became completely self-sufficient um, and is now running itself. Um, so obviously this is the outcome of uh, Limerick Urban Honey. It's unfiltered honey. With, it literally goes straight through one sieve and into the jar. So there's bits of propolis and the odd bee leg in there. And if you're squeamish, it's your own problem. But it's delicious honey. And it, the, the variety from the different hives all over the city uh, is, is quite amazing, the, the, the different flavors. But what it has done, it has, it has upped the level of pollination in those areas where we have located um, hives, um, in particular in the, the Limerick Lear, uh, Learning Hub, because they're very much a community-driven organization and they had a, a community or, uh, orchard, which was doing really, really badly, 200 trees that the local community had paid two euros each but they were never really getting any return from the, from, from the orchard until we put the bees in. And now, since the bees have been in there, they're coming down with apples, so much so that they've started to produce their own um, um, apple uh, pressed apple juice, which they sell and reinvest back into the community. And so every year we do a communal uh, spinning of the honey where we invite the public to come in uh, from the area and participate and we use it as a kind of recruitment drive for the project uh, to get kids and teenagers and uh, adults involved from the area. And you're talking about, you know, you're talking to low to, to poor income families here. And so they're supported all the way through to try and establish hives and to actually earn a little bit money from the sale of their honey. It's not much, but it's, it, it, it goes some way to do it. And then, of course, a big breakthrough for the project uh, was in 2018 when uh, a certain company, which you probably recognize from the product placement in the, in the, the photograph on the left hand side, asked us to locate uh, hives on the top of their roof. Um, and so the deal was, uh, the, the, we said to the company, if you want to uh, 
if you want to have hives on your rooftop, you have to let us train some of your staff to look after the bees. And so that was a bit of negotiation because um, we don't like to just put hives in a place and then walk away. There has to be this kind of purchase. There has to be this kind of community involvement um, from the company to get involved, to put their money where their mouth is, to actually take care, to look after their bees. And so um, the, the other agreement we got from Brown Thomas was that um, they wouldn't sell the honey. Uh, they would actually give it away in the restaurant um, for people who wanted to put it on their, the, on their, on their scones and on their, on their uh, toast in the morning. And, and that there would be some information there um, available for them all the time to, to bring attention back to the whole idea of urban beekeeping and how important it was and how necessary it was to think about cities as food producing areas and also cities with their responsibility towards in, in ensuring that pollinators were, were, were looked after within the urban environment. Um, there's some links to the uh, creative outcomes of, of the project that you can see on this last slide. And I'll share that with for those of you who are interested later, but that's the end of my presentation. Sorry if I went over. Thank you so much. I've actually just dropped into the chat for anyone, um, Sean's sort of website. I've also put a little Vimeo link to the, one of the choirs and sort of sound. I've also put in the Bee Sanctuary and Burn Bio. And then Greensod Ireland are actually just um, launching a biodiversity ambassador program. So the link for that is there as well for any of you. But I'm going to throw it out now for any questions. Please feel free to um, put them in the chat or if anyone wants to turn off their mic and fire away any questions to any of our speakers, please feel free. I have a question for Paul, actually. Um, how is your the scheme to uh, get 2% of farmland going? Has it just been launched or have you um, have had any success or how has it been received? Um, we, we launched it, I think it was within the last two months, we launched it and we immediately had about 25 people back onto us. And we've had, um, I'd say another 15 or so since. So what we're, what we're trying to do is we're, we're establishing a, a standalone website for it. And what we're, 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 we're hoping we can uh, track some sponsorship on that. We'd, we'd see that we'd run that separate now to the B Sanctuary. It's an yeah. initiative coming off the B Sanctuary, but uh, a very good response. I mean, it, what, what surprised us was it, um, it made the Irish Times magazine um, Pot's Hot List and, you know, in the Irish Times magazine on a Saturday. And That's right. Yeah, I saw that. It was great. Yeah. And we, we, like, we thought that was great that, that that was picked up by such a kind of mainstream kind of glossy magazine, I suppose, or, you know, that, that it was picked up and they thought it was cool. So there, there is an appetite out there for it. Um, um, and was it, is, is the idea that you get companies to sponsor the payment or how does it work? Yeah, what well, we're asking initially, we're asking farmers just to show goodwill and just just to come on board without payment okay. um, uh, initially, and um, to give us to give us some kind of movement on it, um, and then we can then we can hopefully approach companies. Ultimately, we'd love to get payment from the EU or from government for it. You know, I mean, I've ran the figures on it, and it's, it's millions, but we're, we're wasting yeah. millions on other schemes. But there is an appetite for it. I mean, I, I mean, I spoke to forty low income farmers from Wexford about a year and a half ago, and it was on. They were looking for. Um, it was to try and get them to think about diversifying on the farm. And I just put it to them. They kind of came around to the table, probably had 15 minutes with the maid at them at a time. And there wasn't one of them said they wouldn't do it. If I could get them a payment of 500 euro an acre, not one of them said they wouldn't do it. <laughs> I but bet you know, they didn't. <laughs> but, but, but if you look at it, I mean, I mean, I mean I've done the figures on that. We're, we're spending, the gloss scheme is is wasting huge amounts of money that, that, yeah. that, isn't, that isn't doing anything. It, it, we could find it if we wanted to, and it would make such a difference. And I mean, there was some, some guys said that they to, turned the whole farm over. I mean, we have this narrative that comes from the IFA and from the, the top, the beef guys and the, and the milk guys that everyone wants to increase their, her, their a lot, they want to check. They want to, they want to be able to send their, their kids to college. You want to be able to have a, have a, have a, a half decent life. And a lot of them don't care where that check comes from. No, you know what I mean? Not at all, no. <laughs> That, that, that's the truth and that, that, that's not being said enough and, and it'll be small fa family farmers that will do it and I think it, it, it could be something that the country could be proud of like a national medal and, go, and we could join it up with, with our hedgerows and, and really do something with it and it'd be nice like we're, 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 there, there's interest we're talking to people at the moment about sponsoring it um, there is definite interest there. Again, we, we prefer if the money came from, from the EU or government. It's not our, our speciality, that kind of fundraising. It, 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 it's, uh, people on here know fundraising. It, it, it's a, an industry unto itself. It, it, it's a skill. 
and it, we don't we, we don't we don't get involved in it. We, what we do is we like putting the ideas out there and seeing if the private sector will come on board with it. Um, but there there is something there. We we, we could do with a hand with it. Um, there's two of us here with a, a laptop and a mobile phone, and we got to keep the keep the sanctuary going as well. But um, we, we our, our take on things is like we could sit here and talk about it. Just just throw it out there and let's do it. You know, and and like I say, we we haven't had a negative reaction yet. I even even somebody I've had someone onto me over Twitter. He's um. If he wanted to kind of farm farm organization, typical guys as I'd call them, and he's interested in seeing how it's doing and and having having a talk about it. So there's an appetite for it, but it it's it's. I think we need to keep it really simple, keep the red tape out of it, and keep it keep it very basic and straightforward, um, and it'll it'll work. Yeah, well done, great. Uh, I actually have a question for Sean. Um, I'm just really interested in when you're talking about collaborating with um, a software developer um, I find it really inspiring because that's what myself and Ashley have been wanting to do with our online talks is to get a big mix of people involved and you know scientists and artists and the whole lot really um, so I'm just wondering what your experiences have been like you know in this project and other ones like have you found that artists are great for getting involved in these kinds of projects or should we is there is there other communities or kind of specialists that we should be inviting as well yeah I mean um, you know everyone's kind of exercised by environmental issues and you know there, there are lots of people out there who are more than willing to get involved and more than willing to collaborate um, and so, yeah, I, I mean, it's very easy to work with a software engineer, you know, you, you give them a problem uh, and, they, and they solve it, you know, um, you, know um, you know, when I first worked with Michael back in 1990, we were making work about rainfall in Ireland. And, and, and I, was, I remember I asked, I asked him, I said, how easy would it be to take rainfall data and make a piece of music out of it? And he was going, I don't know, but let's try. And, and that's how we started. Um, so, I mean, we, you know, we finished a project last year about pollution data in the River Liffey, which was shocking, uh, a beautiful piece of music, <laughs> but, uh, but based on terrible pollution data. Um, and, uh, and it, it, it you know, the, I, I think the thing about making music from this data, there's something about music that, that can, you know, strike people emotionally very, very quickly. Uh, more so than you know, making an object or um, or or me talking about it. Uh, music cuts right through uh, into the soul, and um, when you know the source of the musical composition is, you know, uncomfortable or contested data, um, then it gives it a poignancy. Uh, you, you you know you, whether you whether you like the piece of music or not, you you won't forget where it's come from. And I think that's always been the point uh, of the collaboration between myself and the software engineer. It's to get, it's to get that kind of emotional connection going through the data, because because data can be anonymous and it can be abstract. But when you make a piece of music out of it, it's not abstract. It's real, and it it affects you. Yeah, that that's great. Um, I love that. You know, that's something I think myself and Ashley want to develop further in the future, dare I say it, but um, we're, we're really into that kind of idea of the, what you're doing there is kind of talking about like the, the celebration of like data in your case or biodiversity, um, you know, so I find that really interesting. I think it's That's great. great. I mean, like even when you, so we, you know, it's, it's afforded us the opportunity to work with orchestras like the, the, the Irish Chamber Orchestra. And when you're telling them the story of the piece of music, they, they get really, you know, invested in it, you know, and they really, you know, it's, it, it becomes really important. So what you're creating there is a kind of a community, a community of storytellers, you know, mm -hmm. who, who are through, through their various kind of expertise are telling those stories. And, and, and we all know those stories need to be told and they need to be told again and again and again until people really start to pay attention. Yeah, that's that's really interesting as well, because with, uh, like out of a lot of people that we've spoken to uh, within Green Sod and outside for these talks, the word story keeps cropping up as being the thing of the main message, like everything has a story and we're here to tell that story. So I just find it really interesting. That's one of the resounding words that keeps repeating, you know, so um, that's great to hear. 
I mean, just to finish off, I mean, someone wrote a someone wrote a review about our music recently and and described us as creating the soundtrack to our own destruction. And I thought that was hilarious um, because that's so far away from what we're trying to do. It's the complete opposite. Of what we're, you know, by raising awareness through the music, we're actually trying to get people to change their their behaviors. Not, you know, we're not interested in sounding our own destruction. Far from it. <laughs> No, that's great. Thanks. I think that's the that's the that's the million dollar question in a sense. How can we get people to change and act? And I think a big part of that is getting people to to to, to feel something emotionally. Um, and as as you said, Michelle, like through the stories, through music, um, we need people to feel something and feel connected to nature in order to change. And I think that could, how can we get people to act in a way that, like that that's that to me is the million dollar question we're all doing our part but it is um we know like lots of scientific studies have, have have proven that if children aren't connecting with nature from a very young age as an adult they're not going to feel the emotion we might know we have to do something but we're not going to feel that connection and like, i don't know I think yeah, that, that's a really good point, actually. And I mean, that, that's something we work for quite hard with Borough Bio is working with different levels of the community to create that connection to place. So we've kind of found by going through all the layers and finding out how amazing your place is. But every single course that we run with these groups, they have to do a plan at the end. They have to pick something they want to see nicer, better in their place so they choose even top class national school children we help them come up with a plan we show them it's not rocket science to make a plan and you know we give them all the support they need to show them with the resources in their classroom in their school they can all carry out their plan and they can do something to make their places better so you know I think a lot of times especially with children they kind of think there's a lot of pressure on us to do stuff but they don't know how to do it so it's kind of putting supports into place and enabling people to make that difference. And, you know, we say to them, if one of you picks up litter, that's fab. If three of you pick up litter, that's three of you making your place better. If 10 of you do it, what difference are you making there? So, do you know, I really do think working with the groups and it's just that enabling, isn't it? And helping, but the connection has got to be made, which is where the education and the learning about your place comes in. Sorry, I probably went on for too long there. Uh, not at all, never too long. There is a question, um, a more practical question that's come up in the chat box. It's for Janet just to say, what can I do in my own garden to help promote pollinators and biodiversity? Yeah, I was just responding to that there. So you saved me the hassle of finishing the, the text. Um, it's uh, Gavin. Hey, Gavin. Um, it, to be honest, the easiest thing to do is to stop doing whatever you are management wise in your garden. If you're cutting the grass, stop cutting even just part of it to see what comes up. Like you'll be amazed by the range of species that will pop up in your grass without you doing anything at all. Like their seed bank is there in the soil and it's just literally just waiting for you to stop using the lawnmower. So if you are cutting it every two weeks in the summer, um, just like what I say to people is there's nothing wrong with having a piece of, of grass to sit on, you know, to have your cup of tea or your picnic or for your kids to play on but maybe if you have a slightly bigger patch of ground let some of it grow and only cut it every six weeks which means you're um you're providing food for pollinators and then you might have maybe a, a um, another part near a hedge of a hedgerow that you let grow until september and only cut it so you're providing shelter as well um, and in that way you're providing food for the wild bees um as, as well and they do a lot of our pollination um, and then other things you can do are, are, are plant things for, for pollinators. But really, as I said, the easiest thing to do is to start there and see, see how it goes. You'll be amazed what you'll see. Well, uh, I have to say that that's very true because I, a couple of years ago, purely through economic and health reasons, stopped cutting my garden and have a large garden. And I was amazed that summer how it came to life, how many butterflies and birds and, you know, literally and so I came into doing that purely by accident but it really did in the space of a very short time turn it into a place that was planned into a you know a little wildlife center 
Yeah, yeah, it, it is amazing. And, and then the more that happens, the more you see and the more you're aware and the more you want to learn. And it just, it all has a, a knock-on effect, yeah. Might I be so bold as to stay and maybe not buy plants from general garden centres and um, take your own seeds from your garden or get organic where possible? Yeah, yeah. And that, that, that was a really important point uh, that Paul made about um, that. There was this definitely a study done in the UK that showed the level of pesticides in a lot of those plants. And they were all equally as bad. There's no one company that we're going to, you know, no. aim at here. But um, yeah, take cuttings from your neighbours and your family and friends and you know grow organic seed or even the seed that you get you know when it gets to plant stage the effects of the, the pesticide are, are negligible um but it's just been aware of that most people don't know that it's not their fault they go into the garden center and they see a, a logo that says perfect for pollinators and how are they supposed to know so i think i suppose it's going back isn't it to like how, how we would have done it many years ago people would have taken cuttings we would have been much more aware of nature we would have been you know, we were all, in a sense, biologists. When I think back to my grandparents or great grandparents, they would have been little scientists, artists, philosophers, because they would have been actively engaged in in life in a much we've been distancing ourselves through society um, and making things, I suppose, simpler for ourselves because we've been busying ourselves with other things. That it's really getting back to nature. I think. Mm. I have a quick question for Sean, which I found the idea of listening to the bees absolutely fascinating because we listen to other animals as, a, as an ex-farmer. I mean, you would listen to cows and, and you'd sense their health by that, you know, by the sounds they were making. And but the concept of listening to bees but and getting the chamber orchestra and the thing involved. But I wonder, is that attracting an older audience? And had you ever considered, you know, say, approaching a pop band or now, obviously, any music after the 80s is sort of a mystery to me, but, you know, getting a youth element involved and maybe a youth band into that musical aspect. Yeah, we, we worked uh, we worked with the Donegal Youth Orchestra uh, um, around, we, where we sonified two marine, marine dead zones in Donegal Bay a number of years ago. Yeah, we've worked, we've worked across all the musical genres. And actually, if you, if you go to the website, you'll see a project that we've just finished uh, in Cove in County Cork, where we took the uh, pollution data from the uh, old Hall Boland steel works uh, that was leaching uh, toxins into, into, into the bay, and we created a sea shanty from it. Um, and we've, we, and, and it's all teenagers who are singing that. So yeah, we've, we've, uh, yes, we've, we, we, we realized very quickly that uh, not everybody wants to listen to abstract classical music. So we've worked with jazz bands, we've worked with pop musicians, we've worked with jazz ensembles. Uh, we we uh, we we did a jazz a duet between a jazz ensemble and these water fleas that we use in our water to see uh, to to indicate what toxins are in the water. Um, yeah, so we've we've done a lot of wacky wacky. You'll see it on the website. A lot of wacky projects for for different age groups. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, I, I do find I do think that's brilliant for the simple reason it's getting the message out there. And sadly, if you were to advertise a conference on biodiversity, you're not going to have people queuing in the street yet. If you have a musical concept, you'll have people queued back two blocks getting tickets. So the music is a great way of reaching people. It is. It is indeed. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I actually have a question for Paul. Um, before I ask it, I just, I loved what you were saying earlier about how the bee sanctuary started and you were talking about the beer, the deer coming in, the beer, sorry, I don't know if that's a slip of the tongue. <laughs> the deer coming into um, your land before you kind of had it established as a sanctuary. And it really reminded me of um, David Rowe, who's actually passed away now, he had um, the first piece of gifted land with Greensod Ireland, which was back about 10 years ago now. And it was, it was such a big deal at the time for, for Greensod. Um, and that was when I first started volunteering with them. And we traveled from Galway to Carlo uh, to help him look after his land. And um, he loved the deer, like they were very much part of his whole, concept of protecting land and land for land's sake and all of that and um, he used to actually welcome them into his garden and they would like munch away at everything and 
he was one of those people who was very self-sufficient and grew most of his own food. And uh, I was just, you know, it was one of the first times I'd encountered someone who actually really welcomed the deer in to, and didn't do anything to protect his crops. I just, that, that reminded me of that when you were talking about it there. So I just thought that was wonderful. Um, but on, a, on another side note, um, I just wonder, do you guys ever do tours or anything like that? Do you invite people into your sanctuary or is it very much like a, a place that you kind of keep sort of people separate from or what, how do you go about things there? Just on, on the deer, like we, we love deer. Like every, every time, like I, maybe if we're just naive and childish still, but any time you see a deer, your heart jumps and kind of like, great. And you, you love seeing a deer, you know, it stops us growing trees. I mean, I mean, it does. I mean, the, the only trees that grow naturally here are the ones that come up through the gorse. Um, because the deer can't get to them, but they when they did mm. every nibble, we've about twenty deer come through every evening, and they just they're they're at everything because they're 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 not being moved on. They're they're they kind of they'll stop and they'll browse stuff they probably wouldn't normally browse. I mean, there's there's so much grass and and everything else with the browse, but they'll still go after the trees. We had a Scots pine um, that lost a, a limb there about two weeks ago, and the deer have just been stripping the bark off it every night. Literally, literally within the day, they were over it. And the, but um. It, it, it's a balance. There's, there's probably too many of them, but with us being vegan organic here, we're not going to do anything about it. We we, we, we fenced off um, about an, an acre and a half that we're, where we're growing food on and we're, we're intending to set up a market garden on, but that, that's what we keep for ourselves. And the deer, we, we'll have to, if we put trees in, we have to protect them. That's it, the way we look at it. They're there. We're not doing anything about them. Um, as regards to um, having people through we're we were hoping to open up last year and then with covid it just put everything on hold so what we're doing is we we don't we can't have too many people through because you know yourself the ecosystem won't put up with it we're, we're not a playground we're not entertainment is what we say to people we're we're a serious nature reserve so what we're doing is we're asking people to sign up on our site as friends of the bees and then we, what we'll do is over the summer we'll have certain dates when we're open and we, we'll invite the people have signed up friends of the bees down there'll be a, a small charge i mean what we do is a three-hour tour to, through the um through the sanctuary about an hour and a half of us kind of an educational tour just walking around showing them and then they can go back and have a picnic in, in, in one of the meadows and hang out and just chill out in nature you know so that's the model we have um we're turning people down at the moment like there was pe people onto us all also we had a couple of articles in in mainstream media over the last month or so and we've had people on coming come down and we, we, we could open the gates this weekend and have 50 people 50 cars in you know it, it's not what we're about. We're not. We're not here to make money on it. We we obviously have to make a living, but our our, our ethos is we, we want to have impact. We want to have want to have, make a difference, and we need to protect what's here. So it's that balance. People, we, we want to show when people see it and they're in it, the, the behavioural change comes quicker because they understand it. Um, we'd love to have thousands through, but it, we, we we can't do it to the place. So we're that that's the model. We'll 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 we'll, we'll control the numbers as best we can. It's exactly the same as the land at Greensod. A lot of people say, why, well, you know, why can't we come and visit? And again, it's that idea that, well, we're protecting uh, the wild acres for, for nature's sake and not, not for humans to come and admire it per se. And every, every footprint makes a, makes a difference. Uh, so yeah, it's that fine line because you, you do want to open up to connect people and to get them to understand the importance of what you do. But as you said, there's that treading very softly on the, on the ground as well. So there is that balance. Well, well, also to bring up a sad point, there's also an insurance thing. When you invite people in, you're into that whole public liability, you know, responsibility, and that can get very expensive. Yes, yeah. yeah. It, it, it's, de it's definitely a consideration. Um, we, we, we've looked into it. Um, it, it's, it, it we we hope you just kind of hope people people don't do something something doesn't happen to them and they but you know there's always someone's likely to sue or someone's like to trip over or do something so it's kind of it's it's a risk you take you know you you, you try and cover it but um it 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 that that got that goes back I think to to what 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 everything comes down to is personal responsibility I mean I mean if if people are going to cause themselves to fall over or do something silly and then and then sue you it's the same like we people need to start re rethinking our attitude to 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 life and to nature and to how we how we behave you know i mean i know ourselves we'd never even dream if, if we fell walking down the street it wouldn't even cross your mind to sue someone you know i mean it, it's 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 not in our our way of thinking and it, it's 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 sad that we've got to that stage where you can you can't be businesses can't open because they did they're afraid they're going to be sued because someone will someone will slip on something or, or trip over and, and cut their knee or something you know it, it's and we're very straight and blunt about stuff and we, we're our attitude to that is like listen you know, 
don't. <laughs> well, we have to cover ourselves, you know. Like council, like councils having to cut down trees to, because they're breaking through the footpath. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, crazy. Yeah, crazy. I mean, we were, we, were, we were just looking at just on it. I won't keep, we, we, I was in the middle of one of our meadows the weekend before last, and I got um, a, a cocktail of fungicides in my face from the guy next door. And our, our, our attitude to that one, one two we were, we were thinking, should someone take a test case on that? Because when we rang up the organic trust who were registered with to, to ask, we said, oh, they, that's, you know, just, you, we've, to, we've to plant a buffer strip on our land to stop his pesticides and, and fungicides coming on to. Yeah onto our, 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 our land. Not that it's, it's no responsibility on him. So it's something we're going to be following up on now over the next while just to see. And it's something we would be interested in taking a test case on to, to see if we can, because it, it shouldn't be a case of, or it's kind of like we'll allow organic to exist as long as, you know, as long as you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't kick up too much and we, we don't do that. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's, it's, 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 a, it, again, it's, a, it's, a, it's a conversation another day, but on, mm -hmm. on, on the realities of life on the ground, like say, we can spell pet. We can spell pesticides. We've no role for to be spell pesticides half, right across the sanctuary when they decide to spray it. And there's literally nothing. There's no. There's no nothing we can do about that. Yeah, it's it's a it's a tricky thing when you're when you're doing your best and your neighbor is spraying all around them. It's it's definitely a conversation for another day. You could go on about it for <laughs> hours or days or years, but yeah, just shows we have a long way. It's just about promoting. Sorry, you go, Ashley. I was just going to say, we have a long way to go still. <laughs> go yeah. well, well, I think as Sean made a point earlier, there's an awful lot of people very interested and very keen. And suddenly you'll say, and I've been involved in schemes outside the ecology in that way. You'll get people together and they'll be like, oh, yes, this is brilliant. This is wonderful. I mean, my scheme was I was working with Brothers of Charity, and thankfully it's something that's come to pass, but we were trying to introduce children with disabilities back into schools because back in the 80s they were in one place and the you know the other children were in another and there were school boards and they were all very happy and then when you suggested well how about your school it was suddenly a oh well I'm not so sure about that you know so you need to get people not just to say well yes we support you you know you need to get them physically out there showing that support on that note, I'm going to bring it to a close because I'm very mindful that our speakers were only uh, meant to be here till seven. And thank you all for joining us and indeed for all of the um, participants and people who have joined us. Thank you all for staying on so long. I wish we could go on for, for the whole night. But then I think that's the, that's the thing with environmental issues and biodiversity talks is it's, it's, it's an ongoing conversation that could go on for hours and hours and hours thank thank you all so much for giving your time really really appreciate it and um yeah there's another a, a whole week of events coming up so if you feel like you can tune in again please do thank you all guys so much thank, thank you everyone for your time thank you thanks everyone yeah thank you